in this series looking at um, the values of Harbor Church and what's really important to us here at the Harbor. And I don't know about you, but I really kind of enjoyed this series. And maybe I'm a little bit biased because I've preached a third of the sermons, but it's been, it's been really good, I think, to look back at what's really important to us and why, why we even started this church in the first place. What are we doing here at Harbor Church? And so we've heard a couple of times now John and Jeremy talking about how we kind of assigned sermon passages for this series. And it's true, we have this little chart actually with the date and the person's name who's preaching and then the passage that we're preaching on. And I was looking this week and I saw today's date and my name and then instead of a passage there were like six question marks. So I wasn't, I wasn't really assigned anything this week. I was assigned a bunch of question marks. But um, so I, I kind of had to think through, okay, what, what's the value that's missing? What haven't we talked about yet as a value of Harbor Church? So this morning when Deborah asked me for the sermon, I called it the most important value. And I think that that's true. I think we've missed a really, really big one. And maybe once, once we get it out there, maybe you'll think, oh, that was kind of obvious, or maybe it's been in the background of all the other values that we've been talking about. But I think if we don't say this one out loud, we've really missed the whole point. You see, we've, we've talked a lot about the things that we do and who we are as God's people. We've talked a lot about reaching out into our avoidable and unavoidable worlds, and Libby talked to us about um, following the Great Commission, and we've talked about prayer and sharing our faith with the next generation and being wounded healers and being united together as a church body, all these things that we do but we haven't talked about the one who called us to these things. We haven't talked about the reason behind all of this. And so the value that I want to look at this morning is the value that we at Harbor Church are a place that believes in the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We're a church that believes that God the Father is great and powerful and he created and sustains all things and that Jesus was the Son of God who came to live among us and die for us and be raised, risen again and he's coming back to set all things new. And we believe in the Holy Spirit who comes and empowers us to live out our faith and to live out all of those other values that we've been talking about all summer. That, I think, is our number one most important value here at Harbor Church. So to help us focus on this this morning, let's look at Psalm 8. Um, and if you have a Bible with you, I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version, so it might sound a little different than some of your Bibles, but here we go, Psalm 8. It says, O Lord, our Sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have founded a bulwark because of your foes to silence your enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them? Mortals that you care for them, yet you have made them a little lower than God and than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet. All sheep and oxen and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, and whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O oh Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Will you pray with me? Now we thank you for these words of praise in Psalm 8. We thank you that you are sovereign and you are majestic. And Lord, we ask that these words will change us this morning and that we will leave here transformed into who you would have us be. In your name we pray. Amen. So I'm, I'm on the leadership team of a network of churches in northwest Seattle. This, this is a network that has all kinds of different churches. There are some really, really big churches and really small churches. There are old and, old and established churches and some that are new, like us, that have just been here a couple of years. There's Christian Reformed and Presbyterian and Lutheran and Pentecostal, you name it. There's all kinds of different churches in this network. So we started meeting about a year and a half ago. And the first question that we on this leadership team kind of started asking is, what's the thing that really binds us together? Why would we even meet together in all these different churches in the first place? And so the first thing we started talking about was 
the things that we do in our churches. So some of us had these kinds of you know, ministries for children, and some of us had this kind of thing for adults, and some of us were really reaching out to college students. Some of us had community gardens or preschools or those kinds of things, and we started kind of just going through our job descriptions and talking about the things that we do that fill up our week every week. And it was, it was kind of fun to hear all these stories of all these different churches in Northwest Seattle and what's happening in all these different places, but I started to get a little bit uncomfortable in the conversation, and I couldn't quite put my finger on it at first. But I felt like something was missing. We were, we were missing the mark somewhere, and all of a sudden it dawned on me, what's really important that binds us together isn't that we have a community garden. It's that we have a shared belief and a shared love for the God who made us. That's what binds us together. And once we figured that out, we're all kind of embarrassed and a little bit shocked that it took us that long to get there. And that the really changed finally once we got there, who, who this network came to be. And so my prayer for Harbor Church is that we will be a place where that comes first. My prayer for Harbor Church is that when anyone asks us what it means to be part of Harbor Church or what makes us unique or what what's really important to us at Harbor Church, that the first name that we say will be Jesus Christ. The first thing that comes to mind is that we are a people who believe in God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So to help us kind of look through that today, I think that Psalm, Psalm 8 kind of gives us three different characteristics or attributes of God that we can really focus on. And there are lots of different attributes we could be talking about. I'm sure afterwards you could come up to me and name, you know, six or seven or ten or twenty that I'm not talking about. We're just going to focus on three because we only have 25 or so things. But the first one that it talks about, and in my translation is pretty obvious, um, it says, O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. It says that God is sovereign. So what does that mean? That God is a sovereign God. Well, in First Chronicles 29, verse 11 and 12, it says, Yours, O Lord, are the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, the majesty, for all that is in the heavens and on earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and it's in your hand to make great and to give strength to everyone. In Isaiah 46, it says, For I am God, God speaking himself, I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me. So the scripture shows us that to say that God is sovereign is to say that God rules over everything. Right? And later in the Psalms it says, The earth is the Lord and everything is in it, the world and all who live in it. God rules and reigns over everything. That created and sustains everything. God has a plan and a will for all of creation and our lives. And God has the power to make all of these things happen, to make all these things into reality. And so it's fitting that in the psalm that the psalmist calls God sovereign and then says, how majestic is your name in all the earth? Because this sovereignty thing is a big thing, isn't it? <laughs> it's kind of everything. When, when Libby talked to us a few weeks ago about the Great Commission, she brought up that first line that we probably too often ignore, that Jesus said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. That's a statement of sovereignty. And Libby really challenged us that week that we don't really like that part so much. We don't like a lot of authority in our lives. On Friday, Jeremy and I went to go see the movie The World's End. Um, if you haven't heard of it, it's a movie with Simon Pegg, who's kind of this nerdy British comedian that's one of our favorites. And um, the movie follows five friends who are kind of in their late 40s now, um, but they go back to their small hometown just outside of London for this epic pub crawl they didn't get to finish in high school. <laughs> so they're going back for this pub crawl, and they, they run into some kind of invasion of the body snatchers sort of trouble along the way. And that they, they, they fight against these people that they come across. And I won't tell you any more in case you want to see it, but at the very end, and I promise this isn't a spoiler, 
But at the very end, the main character, Gary, who's played by Simon Pegg, is giving this big, impassioned speech. And you know, it's one of those movie speeches where it starts off really kind of small and timid and then gets bigger and bigger. And all of a sudden, at the end, he shouts what's really the moral of this movie, which is, we are the human race, and we don't like people telling us what to do. That was his big, triumphant moment. We don't like people telling us what to do. And I think that sometimes when we think about the sovereignty of God, that's what we want to shout. We are the human race, and we don't like people telling us what to do. We don't like to hear sometimes that God has a will and a plan because it means that I'm not in control. We really like those words at the end of the poem in Victus, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. We like to be in charge and think that we are the ones with the plan and the will for our lives, and we have the power to make those things happen. But scripture tells us that's not true. Scripture tells us that God is the one who's in charge. And the gift of that sovereignty is that God's sovereignty is matched up with his grace. God is in charge, and God has a will, and God has the power to make that will happen, and he loves us with a deep and everlasting love. We quote this verse a lot around here from Jeremiah 29, the one, you can probably all say it with me, for I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. That's what God's sovereignty does for us. He has a will and a plan to give us a hope and a future. That's what God's sovereignty means. God is in charge and he's working everything for the good of our very souls. So that's the first attribute that Psalm 8 brings out for us about God. And the second one isn't quite as obvious, but it's there. And it's that God is a covenant God where God makes promises and he keeps them. In the psalm, in Psalm 8, it talks about God defeating his enemies and God being mindful of human beings. And what, what the psalmist is doing there is he's kind of alluding to two really big promises that God made to his people. When it talks about God defeating his enemies, it goes all the way back to Adam and Eve when God promised a savior. God promised that he would bring, bring someone to, to crush that snake's head, it says in Genesis. He promised a Savior, and we've seen that promise fulfilled in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And when, when the psalmist talks about God being mindful of human beings, is, is going back to the promise to Moses and Abraham that God would be our God and we would be his people. God promised that we would be his people. He would be mindful of us. He wouldn't just turn away and let the world spin on on its own. He would be mindful of us. Our God wants to be in a relationship with us. And one of the ways he does that is by making these promises and keeping them. And we can see all kinds of promises made throughout scripture. I already mentioned Abraham and Moses where they were promised a nation and they were promised that God would be their God. And you can see the line of Abraham and Moses going all the way to Jesus. God kept that promise of a nation to them. And there are promises for us all over scripture, too. In 1 John, there's a promise that we will be forgiven of our sins if we confess our sins. So if we go before God and confess where we've gone wrong, we know that we will be forgiven because God promised us that. And we've experienced that in our lives. God promises his presence with us, just like he did with Abraham and Moses in the Old Testament. Again, in Libby's sermon a couple weeks ago, she ended with those last lines of the Great Commission, where Jesus says, Surely I am with you always, even to the end of the age. God promises to be with us, to be mindful of us, like it says in this psalm. In Romans 8, it says, For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, or depth, or any other created thing can separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus, our Lord. God promised that. God promised that there would be nothing that can separate us from his love. And God promised us rest for our souls. Jesus himself, 
made that promise in Matthew 11. He said, come to me, all you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. I think many of us have experienced that rest, maybe just in the last couple of days, maybe in the last few years. Maybe some of us are waiting for that rest to really kick in, but we know that it's coming because God promised that someday, somehow, he would give us rest for our souls. Our God is a God who makes promises and he keeps them. I don't know about you, but it seems to me like our promises are getting maybe weaker and weaker <laughs> the more we go on. You can read all kinds of really dire statistics about marriage and divorce and how it seems like people really aren't even taking those promises seriously anymore. We make all these promises to ourselves that we break constantly, promises that we'll forgive that person finally or we'll finally get healthy and by the next day they're gone. One of the things, in fact, that we in Seattle are known for around the country is that we break promises. You probably have heard of this thing called the Seattle Freeze, that it's notoriously hard to make friends when you move to Seattle for the first time. And part of that is we make a lot of promises and we don't follow through on them. So we constantly are saying, sure, I'd love to have you over for dinner sometime, and then we don't ever set a date for when that would be. Or we say, oh, and we should go check out that new museum exhibit or go to this festival at Seattle Center, and then we never actually make the plans. We make the promise, but don't follow through. That's what we're known for, aside from our coffee. We're known for that <laughs> around the rest of the country. Our promises can be so feeble sometimes, but God's are strong. We can see throughout scripture and throughout history how God has made promise after promise, and he's kept each and every one. Our God is a God who keeps his promises. So that's the second attribute. The third one is that our God is a God with a kingdom. In Psalm 8, it says that God set his glory above the heavens. He's praised even by babies and infants. And at the end of the psalm, it kind of lists some ways that we're invited to participate in God's kingdom. God gave us a role. He made us, he gave us glory and honor and gave us dominion over the works of his hands. That's part of our role as God's kingdom people. Because if we, if we believe that God is sovereign and rules over all creation as a king, then our king needs a kingdom. And that's where we're living. That's where we are. We're in God's kingdom. I really like how it was how it was explained in this article that was written for our denomination, the Christian Reformed Church. It says, God's kingdom takes in all of human culture throughout the world. Unlike nations on earth, God's kingdom doesn't have a defined border. It's not restricted to a certain location like a church or a cathedral, nor can it be reduced to religious activity. By God's kingdom, we mean God's whole sovereign rule, God's sphere of influence, we believe that God's spirit is busy extending God's rule all over creation. I like that picture, that God's spirit is busy extending God's rule throughout all of creation. That's what God's kingdom is all about. We can see God's reign maybe pretty clearly in our spiritual experiences and those moments where we really fear God's presence and worship or when we experience renewal after something really difficult happened. We can see God's rule there really easily. But what this kingdom idea gets at is there's no boundary to God's kingdom. Every single area of our life is in God's kingdom. It's all God's world, so it's all God's kingdom. God is constantly with us, guiding us, and working in and through us, transforming us. And so we can see God's reign in all parts of our lives, in our work, in our families, in our marriages, in our schools, in technology, in music, in art, in science, in every single sphere of human life. That's God's kingdom. But what's more, God calls us to participate in that kingdom. God calls us to join with him in living out this kingdom here on earth. And that's why 
we pray. That's why we reach out to our avoidable and unavoidable worlds. That's why we're wounded healers and we're bonded together and unified in this church. And that's why we pass on the faith to the next generation and follow the Great Commission. All of those other values, this is why they're values. Everything else we've talked about, this whole series, hinges on the fact that we are God's kingdom people. At Harvard Church, we believe that God is sovereign and that God keeps his promises. And because of this, every aspect of all of our lives are part of God's kingdom, a part of God's calling on us. And part of what that means is that there's nowhere we can go where God isn't there ahead of us. There's no place we can go to work or do ministry where God doesn't have a head start. That's what God's kingdom is, and that's why all these other values we've been talking about all summer are even values in the first place. Because they're what God is doing in his kingdom. So you see, everything that Harvard Church is, everything we're going to be, everything we hope to be, all of that is nothing if we don't have this belief in the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit at the heart of what we do. Without God and without our love for him and our faith in him, we are nothing. And this church is nothing without that, that foundation on Jesus Christ. No matter what our values might be, no matter what all of these other weeks we've talked about might be, this one value has to be at the heart of it all. That we at Harbor Church believe in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We can't do all these other things without that. And so I pray, like I said before, that when each of us are asked, what does it mean to be part of Harbor Church, or what's really important at Harbor Church, that the first thing we say is we believe in God. We haven't done a lot with creeds here lately, but to end this morning, I'd like for us to join in saying the Apostles' Creed together, just to kind of cement this in our minds. This is why we're here. We're not just here to be inspired or encouraged or to sing some songs. We're here because we believe these truths that we'll say in this creed. So it will be up on the screen. So please join me in saying the Apostles' Creed together. I believe, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit,